Good morning, everyone. It's Easter. I'm Pastor Edward Mooney of First Lutheran Church of Gypsum, and I am just totally thrilled to be here with my brother and brothers and sister in Christ as we celebrate the most important day of our liturgical year. We are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I come in today with great anticipation and excitement. I'd like to introduce everyone just to make sure we know who's who here. Uh, from uh, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Glenwood Springs, we have Pastor Jeff Carlson. Uh, from First Presbyterian Church, also in Glenwood Springs, we have Pastor Melinda Veach. Uh, from St. Stephen's Catholic Church, again in Glenwood Springs, we have uh, Father Bert Chilson. Uh, we have uh, from Valley View Hospital, their chaplain, uh, Pastor uh, Lauren Martin. And on our keyboard, it sounds like a show here, <laughs> on our keyboard is Kyle Jones, who's absolutely amazing. Say hi to Kyle there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a great service for you today because everybody here is just, we are so excited about Easter. And I've got to tell you that I don't believe that any of us have ever had an Easter worship like this. So that's what makes it even more exciting. We'd like to open today with a prayer of the day from Pastor Jeff. This is a prayer that comes from uh, Adam of St. Victor in the 12th century. Let us pray. A day of hope a day of power. This is the day that despoiled the master and set free the slave. Gone is mourning, all is triumph. The blood of Christ extinguishes the flaming sword. Nothing bars our way to the garden. Our child, whose name is Laughter, laughs merrily with the ram, the heralds of life. Joseph, leaps out of the cistern with Christ from darkness into light. Done is death. Even the serpent can come to the feast. Pharaoh, that old snake, slithers away, bitten by Christ, the poisoner poisoned. Here all are safe, lion with lamb. The sparrows have nested in the tree of life. The scapegoat, too, pushed off the cliff, has landed in paradise. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. And at this time, we'd like to remember the children at Christmas, or excuse me, them too, but at Easter. Um, this, is, this is resurrection. This is hope, children. We know we're in a strange situation today, but there is hope in resurrection. So, Pastor Lauren is, has a message for the children, and it's for Easter. So when I was a young boy, my favorite all-time place to go explore um, was a little patch of woods uh, in our neighbor's cow pasture. Uh, it had a little stream running through it. Um, there were flat rocks in the stream. It was, it was such a small stream that you could very easily step over it. And my mom wouldn't care. My dad wouldn't care. I would go spend hours and hours down there. And in this little stream, there were flat rocks. And if you, um, if you got your fingers underneath those flat rocks and turned them over very slowly, you would see salamanders and worms and, and crayfish down there. And um, I, that was just the most exciting thing. And I would, I would I'd line up all these little rocks and I'd create a dam and I'd pretend to be making this this lake for, for the salamanders and, and the crayfish. I loved this place. And there was the cave. So the cave was the scariest part of this little woods. Not so scary as to make me never want to be there, but scary enough to be like very uh, adventurous. And it was big enough for me to walk into. Um, I could reach my arms out at my sides the whole way and not be able to touch the sides. 
And the part I can't tell you about is the very, very back because I never went back there. It was too far. It was not enough courage in my body to go back there. Um, I could see it. And sometimes you could see, uh, I think they were frogs hanging out in the back there, but it was dark. And even though it felt wonderfully cool in those hot Pennsylvania afternoons, um, it was it was just that coolness would refresh my body. And there was water coming out. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was so afraid because there was water coming out of this cave and it would flow into those streams. And um, part of me wanted to live there. I, I would have loved living in that patch of woods and make the cave actually to be, to be my house, my home. And, and at the same time, there was part of me that said, uh, may, maybe if I would go in to this cave and go all the way to the back, I would get stuck in the mud. And then I'd be there for the rest of my life and nobody would ever know what happened to Lauren Martin. And um, I am sure that when I was standing at the outside, looking into this cave, if anyone would have come up behind me and gone, boo, I would have probably would have peed my pants and I would have run the whole way home scared. And I'm wondering, I wonder if in a just a tiny little bit away, that's how all the big people felt. The big people who were the followers of Jesus, the big people who were his disciples, the big people who that morning when they went exploring and they found the cave, the tomb, where the body of Jesus had been laid. Mary was the first one to get there. Women make the greatest explorers. And then two men came, two boys came, and at first they didn't go in, but, but they went in and they looked around and what they saw and what they didn't see. And then they got, they, they, they were excited, they were scared, they were happy, and they were confused all at the very same time. And those two boys, they went running to their home and they ran all the way home and they told everybody at the house what they saw and what they didn't see and what they thought had happened. And, and, and they said, Jesus isn't dead anymore. We can't, his body isn't there. Jesus is not dead. And, and, and some people thought they understood. Some people said, yes, I understand that. And, and some were asking questions of, of how could this be? And, and some were just saying, slow down, slow down. Just tell us again what happened and what you saw and what you didn't see. And, and some just left and, and they walked there to the place to, because they wanted to go see it for themselves and to try to figure out what happened. And I say, it's still the same even today. But what I say happened is that I believe God had a great big plan and that somehow God was God and God was also a human being. That's Jesus. And, and, and as a human being, Jesus lived among us and showed us how to live and how to die and, and taught us how to be human beings and how to treat each other. And, and God's power is so bigger than death that when the people said, no, we can't handle this, Jesus is too, this is too much. And they killed him because, because he, they, well, he threatened them and, and he threatened their ways. And, and Jesus was brought back to life by that great big power of God that's bigger than death. And, and somehow that spirit of Jesus is alive today and that spirit of Jesus is inside of you and it's with us and it's in me and it helps me live and it helps me die. It helps me know how to treat another person and it helps me see God everywhere in this life. That's what the resurrection is about, that it brought everything into perspective that God has this great big plan. And just like that little cave, near my backyard where where i somehow felt both at home and somehow i had so many questions about what it was like god has this great big story and it 
And sometimes I feel very much at home in this story. And sometimes I have questions in this story. But it's Jesus' life and Jesus' teaching and Jesus' dying and Jesus' resurrection. And, and, and the last part of this story is that your story now becomes a part of that great big story of God. Thank you for letting me tell the story. I enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoyed listening to it. Thank you, Pastor Lauren. Oh, gee, you brought back some memories. I remember a cave when I was a little boy and being afraid. I could really identify with that story. I appreciate it very much. At this time, as I have said every week, I am blessed to introduce Kyle Jones on our keyboard. Kyle. Again, thank you, Kyle. Such a blessing to me, to all of us I know. Well, at this point, we turn to the Word of God for this portion of our service. We have our first reading, and we have our gospel reading. Father Bert, would you start us with the first reading? This is a reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Peter proceeded to speak and said, You know what has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews, and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man God raised on the third day, and granted that he be visible, not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commissioned us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Father Bert. At this time, we're about to hear what I consider to be the most powerful thing in the Bible, the story of the resurrection of our Lord with Pastor Melinda. This is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen, linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. 
Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she went over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be to God. Thank you, Pastor Melinda. Now, a great moment as we hear Pastor Jeff Carlson's thoughts on this incredible gospel. Jeff. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <sighs> can we just get back to normal? Can we, can we go outside without looking like bandits? Can we not shrink away from each other when our carts pass each other in the grocery store? I have two friends each who lives alone, Aaron and Scott, who have now gone more than a month without the touch of another human being. Can, can I take a break from trying to figure out another new technology? Can I stop checking new case totals and death totals uh, at the end of every evening? Can we, can we give thanks for medical teams and grocery workers and law enforcement officers and others without being so fearful for them? Can we just get back to normal? Although, to be fair, even normal is not always what it seems. I saw a video uh, the other day that was filmed uh, long before the, the coronavirus hijacked our lives. And in it, um, the actress Liza Koshi is uh, finishing up an, an interview that she's done. And, and she stands up and they take off her lapel mic and she says thank you to everyone, says her farewells. And then she moves to the door of the room and the, the door is a little bit sticky and she pushes harder and pushes it open. And unbeknownst to her, on the other side of that door is a girl and the door smacks her right in the face. And, and you can just see that something terrible has happened. Her face is, is covered with blood. The girl slumps to the floor. Uh, Liza looks around and, and sees a, a table nearby with some clean towels. She grabs one, holds it up to the, the girl's face, who recognizes this, oh, you're, you're Liza Koshi. Um, and Liza says, uh, we need to get you some help. She said, could you just walk with me and, 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 and take me back to my family? Just, just stay with me, please. And, and Liza, sure enough, she, she walks with her. They go outside to the garden where there are a whole bunch of uh, folding chairs set up and, and people are sitting in the folding chairs and lo and behold, it's the girl's bat mitzvah. But she doesn't want to let her, her new friend go. So she holds her hand and they walk forward and sit on, on the dais. There's an empty chair there, which turns out the aunt who's sitting on the other side of the empty chair tells her, we left the chair empty there for her, her mother who, who died a, a couple of months ago. But that's okay. That's okay. Just We're, we're glad you're here. And and she's, you can tell she's, she's awkward, but she's trying to be helpful. She stands up with the girl when she's reciting the Hebrew, tries to join in with her, tries to figure out how to wrap the prayer shawl around her. And then the, the rabbi says, uh, the last thing the mother requested was that on her mother's bat mitzvah at the end, that we release two doves as a sign of, of peace, hope for peace in the world. And the girl says, will you please help me? Will you, will you help me pull the cord to release the doves from this box that's uh, way above the, the crowd. And 
And so Liza helps him and she pulls on the cord, but instead of the box opening and doves flying away, the box falls, hits a guest who falls into the table where all the glasses of champagne are filled, crashes the table. The whole thing is just a terrible mess. And it's at that moment, it's at that moment that Liza's friend, Chance the Rapper, appears from his hiding place to announce that it's all been a setup. It's all been a prank. It's part of a famous show that Chance has revived. And uh, Liza turns to the camera with a smile and confesses, I'm Liza Koshy, and I just got punked. Jesus' disciples have a far worse week than what Liza has just experienced, and it's, it's no prank. It's as real or more real than the horrors of COVID-19 that we are all dealing with now. Jesus, who arrived just a week ago, can it have been just a week ago, arrived in Jerusalem with crowds hailing him as prophet and son of David, and now such a short time later, he's been betrayed by a friend, he's been arrested, he's been abandoned by his other disciples, physically assaulted by guards, falsely accused, railroaded by the authorities, tortured by soldiers, humiliated and crucified. And now, early, early on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene trudges to the tomb, racked with grief, only to discover that the tomb is empty. I can't even imagine entirely what, what must be going through her mind and her heart as her, her heart is racing. Is it, is it shock? Is it panic? Is it fury? What is she experiencing? She runs to tell the disciples, and Peter and the one called the beloved disciple race to the tomb to see for themselves. They look around inside, they scratch their heads, and they conclude, yep, Mary, you're right. He's not here. And they go back home again. And Mary is left there alone, sobbing outside the empty tomb, which is not on its own a sign of hope and joy. It is instead a sign to Mary of desecration. It's a sign of deeper anguish than she already had. She peers into the tomb and she sees two angels. Now, we, the readers, are told that they're angels, but does she know that that's what they are? I don't know. Now, Peter and the other disciples seemingly were so intent on verifying whether what Mary said was, was factual or not, wondering whether it's just, just another melodramatic whim, woman, as, as men do, so busy trying to verify and prove that they never actually acknowledged Mary's sorrow or did anything to comfort her. But these two angels, they actually bothered to ask, why are you weeping? And she answers, someone has taken away my Lord's body and I don't know where. Then, does she, does she hear a sound behind her? Does she somehow sense that someone has approached? Does the hair stand up on the back of her neck? She turns and she sees a man she supposes to be the gardener, who also tends to her grief and asks, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And she answers, if you're the one who has taken away my Lord's body, please just tell me where you've taken him and I'll take care of it. And then the big reveal. But it's not Chance the rapper, it's Jesus. Mary, he says, teacher, she cries. But Mary has not been punked. Mary has been Eastered. I imagine that like us, Mary in this moment may be desperate to just return to normal. You're alive, praise God. We can go back to the way things were before. Maybe now people will, will believe that you really are indeed the Messiah. Jesus urges Mary not to grasp onto the normal, the familiar, the formal, the former. He, he doesn't chastise her for failing to practice social distancing. It's not six feet now, Mary, six feet. It's not that. Instead, what he says is essentially, I'm not done yet. I've got greater things in store. I, I'm returning to the Father, to my origin, to who I always have been and where and when I always have been. And I'll be sending the Holy Spirit to bring my presence and my power in a new reality you could never have imagined, Mary. It will come in you and around you and above you and beneath you. It'll come to you as individuals and as a community so that you all together can share in my work of embodying this resurrection, compassion and transformation with the whole world. Now go, he says, go and tell the others. And Mary does just that. 
because being Eastered is not about returning to the normal. It's not about bouncing back. It's not about being resilient. It's about being transformed. Resurrection life, Jesus shows us, is unconquerable. It, it can never be taken away. We'll find out in the next part of John's story that Jesus' scars remain, but they remain on a body and a presence and a power that are astounding, that are new and amazing. Now, I'm convinced that we need to be Eastered at least once a year. It, I do, anyway. I, I think I need at least 40 days to prepare for it, and I need maybe another 50 to live into it the seasons of Lent and the season of Easter. I need to die at least once a year to something and to trust in God to resurrect me, to transform me, not just tweak, not just polish, not just improve. There are things in my life that need to be dead and buried so that God can raise up in me something more closely attuned to the mind and heart and spirit of Jesus. Lately, one of those things that needs to die in me is not good enough. Oh, I just, that, that, that's the mantra that resounds around in my head and my heart and my spirit. Not good enough. Caring friends might try to persuade me. Oh, come on, you're, you're good enough. You know, give yourself a break. You tried hard. You, people got something out of, out of what, what you gave. Don't, don't beat yourself that, up that way. Caring friends will comfort and console and encourage. But there's something deep inside of me that ain't buying it. There's something deep inside of me that says, I, I just know that it's not what I could have done. It's not what I wanted to do. It's not what God wanted of me. It's not enough. And this Easter, oh, I am asking God to just kill it. Just allow me to stop fighting it. Just name it, claim it, and kill it. Just be able to say, you're right, Jeff. <laughs> you're not good enough. You are not good enough, and you never will be. Just let that die and trust that God will resurrect something new in its place, a new identity, a new reality as broken beloved. Still scarred, but living into resurrection reality. I need to be Eastered, to move not backward, but forward. I need to practice living into a different core identity, to acknowledge that Eastering happened for me once upon a time, once long ago, in a moment, on that Sunday, in the garden, and also at the same time, it's something that is happening day by day, over and over again, that I need to live into. If not good enough can die off, then there'll be more room to look beyond myself with, with more genuine energy and genuine compassion for others. I don't have to be all about self-assessment anymore. How about you? What in your life needs to die? Disappointment? Guilt? Shame? What do you need to allow, not merely to be tweaked or explained, but to die in order for God to resurrect in its place a you that knows that you are God's broken beloved? You are one for whom God would die and has died someone for whom God would resurrect and has resurrected, that you are God's broken beloved, together with a community of other broken beloveds, practicing, living into imperfect but genuine compassion for the rest of God's broken beloved world. On Good Friday, death and sin thought they had won out. They stuffed Jesus into that tomb. It was done. They had won it all. And then on Sunday, Jesus comes forth, and they realize that they've been punked. But you and I, we have not been punked. Now, you may have doubts. But as Pastor Lauren said, you, you, you may wonder. You may not know for sure if, if you buy this whole story. And you know what? I think that's fine. I think be honest. Be where we are. I think even most of us who are pastors have doubts and questions sometimes. I think it's fine to have doubts about the resurrection of Jesus because I am convinced that the resurrected Jesus has no doubts about you. He dies and rises not only for those who think the right thoughts, who ascribe to the correct doctrines, to those who are good enough, whatever the heck that means. But God so loved the cosmos 
that he gave his own self, God gave God's own self to die and rise for that cosmos out of love for it. He dies and rises for all of us to rearrange the essential reality of time and space so that they come into greater harmony with God's destiny for us all. This is no mere resuscitation. This is no return to normal. This is resurrection. We are God's broken beloveds. And you know what? We just got Eastered. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Um, a while ago, I went to Pastor Jeff and I said to him, I am not good enough to do what I am doing. And he said, welcome to the club. And I can't tell you what that meant to me, my friend. And I think all of us here realize that what Jesus Christ has done for us today on the resurrection, none of us deserved it, but he gave it with great love and great compassion. Thank you, my friend. And now, we know everyone is struggling with finances and worries. And I, unfortunately, we've given Pastor Lauren one of the tougher parts of today's sermon to talk about uh, an offering. My friend, the show is yours. <laughs> so I remember when I was a pastor at that Glenwood Mennonite Church, it, it's called Defiance Church now. Um, sometimes I would get so excited to start my sermon that I would completely forget the offering and uh, skip it. Um, I would, I would, I would literally be starting my sermon and somebody would say, uh, Lauren, um, you forgot your sermon. Uh, you forgot the offering again. And, um, another, another time I was, I was looking for the offering baskets. I could not find the offering, but I don't know what was going on, but, but I was looking for them and I couldn't find them. And finally I go back into the, to, to like the library, the, 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 the classroom and there was a globe that was kind of falling apart. Uh, it was that it was that plastic um, paper paperboard kind, and it was the world was beginning to crack. Uh, so I pulled that globe apart and opened those two halves, and in that we collected the offering. I always loved that symbolism. I thought that was the best way of sharing what an offering was, that, that out of our brokenness, we would collect what we have with a grand belief that it would be part of this new, this, this globe around the world that, that our gifts would touch lives. Um, that from one spot on earth to the rest of the world, God's love and God's generosity go out. So there are, you know, there are so many ways to give. Um, your time, um, your service, your prayers, your finances, your leadership, uh, your talent. Um, I know that the group is working on, on a special gift to those that are the most vulnerable. I, I think that's an absolute, um, I hope somebody says something about that this morning again, uh, spontaneously. Ed, maybe you can lead out in that. Um, I, I, it doesn't matter how much you give. It matters why and, and, and how you do it, I, I believe. Um, Would you pause for a little prayer blessing right here, right now? Lord, let each congregation be a witness to you this morning, immersed in the story, being constant in our prayer, joyful in worship, and generous in our giving. Let us all be a loving, supportive community reaching out for those in need, especially the most vulnerable. 
accept these gifts we offer, which we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, at this point, I would like to ask uh, Pastor Jeff, could you come in? It's not on our script but talk a little bit about what you're doing. There are so many people in our community who are scared, who are hurting, who are alone, who are going without. And I'd really like to take a moment to ask Jeff to talk about the efforts that are being made in the Glenwood Springs area. Would you, sir? Each of our congregations, to the extent that we're able to, are, are not only asking you to, to contribute, but to the extent that we're able uh, willing to help others uh, financially as we can. Also, there are other ways that we continue to be active in the community. Uh, Father Bert and I and many others are working through the Mountain Voices Project to try to speak up for and with those uh, folks who are vulnerable and frightened about their uh, housing situation to make sure that those in authority are assuring them that uh, they will be safe during this time and also together with many others in the community, we have put together uh, a group called Helping Hands for Vulnerable People, trying to match together folks who would like to volunteer to help with folks who are vulnerable and either need someone to uh, deliver, uh, purchase and deliver groceries for them to their home and or perhaps just make a daily uh, call in, check in, telephone call to make sure that we, we continue to be connected with one another. Uh, the website, if you want to uh, look for that, is www.hhvp81601.com. And thank you all for all of the many ways, small and deep, that you are serving in the community. It is noticed and it is appreciated. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. At this time, I would ask all of my brothers and sister to join with me in the prayers of intercession in the Lord's Prayer. If you could all each unmute yourself at this time, we're going to go to gallery view. So go ahead and unmute. As I finish each prayer, please respond with, hear our prayer. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. At this moment, bring forth into your heart those people you need to pray for at this time of this Easter. God of resurrection, from the very beginning you give the church the gift of women as your witnesses as preachers, teachers, and leaders. Open our ears to their proclamation this day and always. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. All of your creation praises you. The earth hums, the seas pulse, the stars shine, and the galaxies world in glorious harmonies to honor you. Let us hear and blend our voices in this song. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The countries of the world experience disunity, conflict, and pandemic. We set our minds on fear and greed rather than on your rule of justice and steadfast love. Build up all countries on your cornerstone of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We still weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. Cradle the fearful, the suffering, and the dying, assuring them of your loving presence in this time of pandemic. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless the creative and helpful service of worship leaders this day. Musicians, ushers, greeters, worship assistants, preachers, readers, and all others who provide welcome and hospitality in our midst. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Risen Lord, you went ahead of us into the grave and defeated the powers of evil. 
we now remember those who have died. Inspire us to live our lives in this resurrection hope and draw us to you in our final days. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, would you all pray with me the Lord's Prayer? And as we spoke earlier, since this is an ecumenical uh, <laughs> gathering, we're going to use the word trespasses. But that's whatever way you pray, pray from your heart with me this time. The Lord's Prayer or the Our Father. Our Father, Father who art in heaven. 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 Hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the power and the glory, the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. My friends, thank you so much. At this moment, I would like to turn to Pastor Melinda for a word about communion. Um, because of our distancing and um, worshiping online together, still there is the spirit of communion among us. And we know that as we gather and worship, we are gathering at the Lord's table, at the table of Jesus' spirit. And therefore, knowing that we are sharing in this meal of worship, um, I have a prayer that I want to send you with um, as you also gather on this Easter, Easter day with those around your table. So listen to this prayer. Holy and risen Lord, we share this meal with grace for the joy and nourishment of food, the slowed time away from the world to come into your presence and into the presence of each other to sense the subtle lives behind our faces, the different colors of our voices, the edges of hungers we keep private, the circle of love that unites us. We pray that your wise spirit who keeps us would change the structures that make others hunger, and that after such grace, we might now go forth and impart dignity wherever we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Melinda. Um, we've come to a part of the service that I've come to always look forward to. Our friend Kyle will be playing some music for us. Kyle? Thank you again, Kyle. I appreciate that very much. We're coming towards the end of our worship. 
But this is the beginning. This is Easter. This is resurrection. This is new life. And I'm going to ask Father Bert, would you give us a benediction, sir? Indeed. Let us pray. Lord, send down your blessing upon us. For by the resurrection of your Son, he has given us new life and renewed hope. Help us to live as new people in pursuit of the Easter ideal. Grant us wisdom to know what we must do, the will to want to do it in these times, the courage to undertake it, the perseverance to continue to do it, and the strength to complete it. May Almighty God bless us through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, who is risen indeed. Alleluia, alleluia, amen. Thank you, Father Bert. I would like to end our service with saying something that I remember from childhood. I used to go to Holy Family Catholic Church in Orange, California, and I remember Father Zeman, at the very end, he'd put his arms up and he would say, Jesus is risen. This is why we're here. You have been granted life. And I wish to bless all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the risen Lord. Amen. Amen.